In the modern world, there is an extensive set of international treaties in place regarding the proper conduct of war, but with an international system that is still anarchical, there are many violations of these supposed laws of war. In this video, we will look at some notable war crimes from the world wars and why they were considered that way. There have been customs for what was regarded as the proper or improper conduct of warfare since ancient times. For example, there was an almost universally agreed protocol that cities or fortifications which surrendered to a besieging army in a quick enough time frame would be spared from complete destruction. The Roman policy was to spare a city which surrendered before the first hammer stroke of a battering ram against its wall or gates. Past this point, it and its population would forfeit humane treatment. Even the Mongols accepted a similar custom. Though they were known for their brutality, cities which surrendered to them quickly were usually spared. Few armies saw any problem with massacring populations which had resisted them for a lengthy period of time. The laws of proper conduct in warfare have become much more formally codified since those days, but unfortunately this hasn't stopped war crimes from taking place. One of the first examples of widespread industrial war crimes in the modern era was the use of chemical weapons in World War I. These substances had been prohibited by the 1899 Hague Convention's declaration on the use of projectiles, the object of which is diffusion of asphyxiating or deleterious gases. This article prohibited the use of artillery shells or other projectiles meant to spread poison gas. Although it had certain reservations, it would only bind the contracting powers in case of a war between two or more of them and would cease to be binding when a non-contracting power would join one of the belligerents. The subsequent 1907 Hague Convention reiterated the ban on poison gas. By the time of World War I, every major power had ratified this provision except the United States. The first use of lethal chemical weapons in World War I came in April 1915, during the Second Battle of Ypres. On the 22nd, German troops unleashed 160 tons of chlorine gas, with the wind carrying the yellow cloud toward Allied lines. Despite the use of this weapon against troops that had not yet been accustomed to gas masks, the line held at Ypres. Still, the genie was now out of the bottle. From that point forward, both sides of the war would use chemical weapons, bringing even worse ones like phosgene and mustard gas to the battlefield before the end. The German Empire had joined the prohibition on chemical weapons in 1900, without reservations or declarations. Its decision to use chemical weapons was therefore considered a war crime, because the Germans used the poison gas in a war with other contracting powers to the Hague Convention. The Allies used the prohibited substances afterward. It's notable that the belligerents in the Second World War largely avoided using chemical weapons, on the battlefield at least. The war was rife with chemical substances in other settings you are all familiar with. While the Holocaust was the most infamous crime of the Second World War, the treatment of prisoners of war was also a major offence. The war crimes bring the extensive protections afforded to POWs in international humanitarian law to light and the progress made in this area over the centuries. In pre-modern times, prisoners of war were regarded with little care. In the ancient world, they were seen as items of booty to be sold into slavery for their captors' profit. While the lot of prisoners improved over the years, they were still treated poorly on a routine basis. For example, the treatment of British prisoners in Germany during the First World War ranged from adequate to bad. British and Commonwealth POWs in the Middle East were treated much worse. They were given little food, and the food they did get was of awful quality. One British prisoner in the Middle East mentioned that he only got a daily ration of one piece of black bread about half the size of his palm, something like a plate of sauerkraut and poor coffee. The soldier Thomas Mitchell Fox mentioned that this diet made him so weak that he could only climb two steps normally and needed to use his hands and knees to navigate the remainder. Proper treatment of POWs was clarified with the Third Geneva Convention of 1929. Article 4 of this document states that the power detaining prisoners of war is bound to provide for their maintenance. Additionally, the detaining power must not differentiate in the treatment of prisoners except for their rank, state of health, professional qualifications, or sex of those who profit nearby. Nazi Germany did not follow this provision in its treatment of POWs. While prisoners captured on the Western Front were generally treated in line with the Geneva Convention, prisoners from the Eastern Front were treated terribly. Officially, the Nazi regime declared that since the Soviet Union had not ratified the Geneva Convention, it was under no obligation to treat Soviet POWs in line with its provisions. The Soviet Union had also not declared its commitment to the 1907 Hague Convention. Unofficially, Nazi Germany regarded the inhabitants of Eastern Europe as racially inferior undesirables who needed to be dispossessed of their lands to make room for the ethnic German colonists. 
This was the living space or Lebensraum policy. Soviet POWs were treated accordingly. Soviet prisoners often had to march to prison camps over hundreds of miles. Those who could not do so were shot on the spot. Soldiers lucky enough to get put on trains were exposed to the elements. Mass shootings were common as well. The Nazis tended to kill off severely wounded Soviet soldiers in order to free medical resources for their own use, which was a clear violation of the 1929 Third Geneva Convention's Article 14, which states, Prisoners affected with a serious illness or whose condition necessitates an important surgical operation must be admitted, at the expense of the detaining power, to any military or civil medical unit qualified to treat them. In total, between 25 and 70 percent of prisoners on these trains from occupied territory to Germany died on the way to their confinement. In August 1941, the Nazis made a policy of providing Soviet POWs with a ration of 2,200 calories per day. Although this sounds adequate, Soviet prisoners were put to work under hard labor, which demanded more energy. In practice, even this ration was often ignored. Many Soviet prisoners only got a ration of 700 calories per day. Death by starvation was therefore common among Soviet POWs. In addition to inadequate food, the Nazis failed to provide adequate sanitation. Prisoners often had to make their own basic shelter by digging holes. Typhoid and dysentery were common in the camps and became the leading cause of death by the end of 1941. In fact, the Auschwitz-Birkenau and Majdanek camps were originally built for Soviet POWs, but since few had arrived, Heinrich Himmler, the interior minister and leader of the SS, decided to convert them into concentration camps for Jews. The Japanese were equally brutal with their POWs. Japan signed but never ratified the Third Geneva Convention of 1929, however it was party to the Hague Convention. The second article of the 1899 Hague Convention specified that POWs needed to be treated humanely, be assigned to labor tasks that were not excessive, be paid for their work, and be treated as regards food, quarters and clothing on the same footing as the troops of the government which has captured them. Japan followed none of these provisions in the Second World War. Japan's mistreatment of its POWs came partly from cultural practices. Japanese military philosophy held surrender in contempt. This was why even as Hiroshima and Nagasaki got hit with atomic bombs at the end of the war, the Japanese government still wavered on surrendering. Like their Nazi allies, the Japanese forced their prisoners to work under slave-like conditions on a starvation diet. British Commonwealth and Dutch POWs in the Far Eastern theater became severely malnourished under a diet of rice and vegetables. Red Cross aid was deliberately withheld. As an empire with extensive overseas territories, Japan often shipped its prisoners around its far-flung holdings on hell ships. One of the American POWs captured in the Philippines described 1,600 people being stuffed into a vessel meant for 500. There was no way to move under such conditions, and since this was in the Philippines, it was hot. The men screamed for water which did not come. Instead, Japanese soldiers put tops on the holds to reduce what they considered noise pollution. Men began to suffocate. The American POW described soldiers cutting each other to drink blood. Another American POW describes being stuffed into a lower deck among 2,000 other prisoners. They were only allowed to use the bathroom once a day for 10 minutes. The food for the first two weeks was a cup of fish soup and crackers contaminated with soap. Unsurprisingly, diarrhea was common and the prisoners were forced to sit in the excrement. Dozens died and were cast overboard. Elsewhere, an American POW describes being forced to labor in mines with rotting timbers and low overhead. 25 were lowered in a small container at a time to be dropped down 2,000 feet every morning. The Japanese soldiers had fun bouncing us up and down, he said. The cable attached to the top of the container was precarious and the men were sure it would snap. Japan's treatment of Chinese POWs and civilians was even worse. There, the rights of these people supposedly afforded under international law were ignored to an even greater degree. The rape of Nanking was the most infamous Japanese war crime of this sort, but it was far from the only one. Among the violations of international humanitarian law, Japanese personnel and those from their puppet state in Manchuria were permitted to kill people on the spot in retaliation for real or even suspected anti-Japanese sentiment. This sometimes led to the massacre of entire villages. When it came to dealing with Chinese prisoners, the Japanese had a guideline that was published in the 1933 book titled A Study of Ways to Fight the Chinese Army. The key passage read, There is no need to take POWs into custody nor return them, in contrast with our treatment of POWs of other nationalities. Except in certain special cases, it is sufficient to free them on the spot 
or in another location. Further, the Chinese system of residency registration is imperfect, and most soldiers are homeless anyway and seldom registered. Thus, no problems will arise if we kill them or deport them. In following this instruction, one of the Japanese major generals in China admitted to a mass execution of 14,777 POWs. Since he was having a hard time feeding even his own forces, he decided that these prisoners were expendable and executed all of them by mass machine gun fire over two days. In 1942, the Japanese military codified its policy on POWs in a document titled Rules for the Treatment of POWs. While this document specified that American and European POWs needed to be interned in camps, there was no such policy regarding Asians. The Japanese feared reprisals from the Western powers for the mistreatment of prisoners, but had no such fear among Asians. Although the document said that Asian POWs could be freed after taking an oath, in practice, many of them were executed on the spot. The Soviet Union's commission of war crimes also reached an industrial scale. In a sign of the extent that these crimes have been overlooked in the West, there are relatively few sources in English about the details of some of them. Nevertheless, we will bring a few examples to attention. Soviet war crimes were committed not only against their German enemies, but against the people of Eastern Europe in general. War crimes were also part of the Soviet Union's military doctrine. For example, the Soviet Union implemented a scorched earth policy to deal with the German war machine following the Nazi invasion in late June 1941. Specialized destruction battalions formed as part of this policy. These battalions did far more than deprive the Germans of useful war materials, however. Crimes against civilians were common. The Kautler massacre was one of the more notable examples. In addition to destroying the farms in the area of Kautler, Estonia, destruction battalion troops under the NKVD massacred 30 civilians. Thousands of people were murdered in Estonia alone by the destruction battalions. Sexual violence also occurred on a mass scale. Although the behavior of the Red Army troops in Berlin is general knowledge even today, the women of Poland had it almost as bad as their German counterparts. Marcin Saremba of the Polish Academy of Sciences estimates that at least 100,000 women were raped during the Soviet liberation of Poland. Sexually transmitted infections spiked to epidemic levels as a result. The murder of German civilians was also a common occurrence. One of the more well-known examples is the Treuenbrietzen massacre on April 23, 1945, which coincidentally occurred on the same day as the German massacre of Italian POWs there. In the Soviet case, a Red Army officer had apparently been shot dead while he was celebrating the capture of the village, and German troops briefly reoccupied it. In response, the Red Army executed about 270 civilians on the edge of a nearby forest. The massacre continued, and between 800 and 1,000 civilians were executed there by the war's end. Additionally, hundreds of thousands of German civilians were deported and forced to labor in the Soviet Union between 1945 and 1950, a war crime extensively documented in Pavel Polian's book Against Their Will, The History and Geography of Forced Migrations in the USSR. Hundreds of thousands of German POWs also died in brutal Soviet camps. Though the Soviet Union's Western allies generally tried to respect international humanitarian law, they were far from perfect in practice and often ignored war crimes when they occurred, even if such crimes did not rise to the level of official policy. On the policy level, the United States Navy adopted unrestricted submarine warfare on a unilateral basis. Admiral Nimitz admitted that the US Navy had carried out this policy from the first day it entered the Pacific War. Ironically, this admission came during the trial of the German Admiral Karl Dönitz, who was charged with waging unrestricted submarine warfare in violation of the Naval Protocol of 1936 and the London Naval Agreement of 1930, which prohibited the sinking of merchant ships by submarines without providing lifeboats for the crew unless these vessels persistently refused to stop upon being summoned or if they resisted a search. There were also individual acts of brutality that constituted war crimes. One of the most infamous American crimes of the war was the Biscari Massacre on July 14, 1943, after landings on Sicily. The massacre involved two separate incidents. The first came when Sergeant Horace T. West was part of an escort that took 48 German and Italian POWs to the rear for questioning. West then declared he was going to kill the sons of bitches and borrowed a Thompson submachine gun. After gunning them down, he reloaded the weapon and fired single shots into the hearts of those who he saw were still moving. On the same day, West's company commander, Captain John T. Compton, also ordered the execution of an additional 36 prisoners. The Corps commander, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, quickly got word of the incident 
and reported these men to the 7th Army commander, Lieutenant General George Patton. The latter wanted to cover the massacre up and claimed that the dead prisoners had been snipers, but Bradley insisted that charges be brought against West and Compton. Compton was acquitted on the charges but killed in action in November 1943. West was given a life sentence. However, he was later paroled and quietly returned to combat by the War Department, albeit with the demotion to the rank of private. He became a minor celebrity in his unit and his exploits as a sniper became the subject in some of the media. A similar incident occurred in the Chanon massacre in Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. On New Year's Day 1945, a unit of the 11th Armoured Division stationed in the village of Chanon captured about 60 German prisoners. These prisoners were marched behind a hill and massacred with machine gun fire. When George Patton got word of the incident, he mentioned in his papers that he hoped the atrocity could be concealed. Soldiers of the United Kingdom and the British Commonwealth weren't above committing war crimes either. On the policy level, the Royal Navy carried out its own campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare during the Battle of the Atlantic, despite the United Kingdom's being a party to the London Naval Treaty. British troops also carried out massacres of prisoners. Some of the smaller but more notable examples occurred in the career of the HMS Torbay submarine. On June 29, 1941, the submarine sank a kike and a schooner, which were sailing under German flags. After these attacks, the Torbay's CO, Lieutenant Commander Anthony Myers, shot the shipwrecked survivors with two Lewis machine guns until he was sure that no one lived. Then, on July 9th, the Torbay sank another kike along with its entire crew. The next ship surrendered. During boarding, two of the Germans offered resistance, one with a hand grenade and the other with a raised rifle. These were neutralized, but the others surrendered and were disarmed. A corporal named John Bremner tried to lead the POWs onto the submarine, but Myers then shouted, U-boats never take prisoners. Bremner tried to find lifeboats, but there were none on hand. When he reappeared on the deck, the German POWs were gone. Witnesses disagree as to what happened. One German officer said they had been put in a dinghy and shot. Crew members said that they had been pushed overboard and shot, with two of Myers' subordinates refusing to carry out the command. Myers admitted in his own notebook that he had killed POWs. These acts were in violation of the 1907 Hague Convention, which forbade the killing of shipwrecked survivors under any circumstances. Punishment was not forthcoming, however. Myers was simply ordered to refrain from such actions in the future. Looting was widespread in the Allied armies too, especially when they entered Germany. Officers routinely looked the other way. And although the Soviets got most of the attention in terms of rape, it was far too common among the Western Allies too. In Taken by Force, the American criminology professor J. Robert Lilly estimated that American troops committed 11,000 rapes during the occupation of Germany. Other estimates are much higher. Miriam Gebhard's book, When the Soldiers Came, estimates that 5% of all post-war births in Germany occurred from rape, which Lilly said was plausible. The mass rape by all sides in World War II was one of the things which prompted the creation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibited looting, deportation, rape, and enforced prostitution. Interestingly, the strategic bombing of cities in Germany and Japan were not universally considered war crimes, as no international treaty prohibited air attacks on these cities with their civilian targets. However, the second article of the 1899 Hague Convention did prohibit bombardments of undefended towns. The Allies skirted around this provision by suggesting that thanks to the military targets in them, the cities were defended. The war crimes of the world wars demonstrate the inherent weakness of international law. Because there's no true lawmaking body in an international setting, treaties require the cooperation of nation states in order to be workable. During wartime, with victory in the highest interest of any state, these treaties will often be ignored for convenience. Such was the case in the world wars, and it's been the case in conflicts today. What other war crimes from this period do you think are worth mentioning? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.